Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nollies. In this video and this next series of videos, I'll be talking about um, a series of equations uh, that we call the empirical gas laws. And the reason for that is because these equations are basically laws uh, that were observed over a period of several hundred years that relate certain properties of gases with other properties of gases. <clears throat> The next topic we will discuss is this concept called the ideal gas equation, which is closely related to the empirical gas laws. Okay, so let's start. First off, what we want to talk about is just what properties that uh, would be um, observed in terms of relationships in these empirical laws. And there are first, um, there are uh, four different properties that would be related to each other in all of these different empirical gas laws. The first one is pressure, and this is of course a property that I discussed in the previous videos on gas pressure, so if you forget what pressure is, you should look back at those videos and try to answer the questionnaire again, remind you of how to make pressure calculations and measurement. Volume is another property that you'll see be, would be related to uh, some of these other properties. And with gases, we want to think about a couple of different types of containers. One is a fixed volume container, uh, for example, something like a, a box of a given size, um, where the gas will just fill it up, okay? Or, for example, if you're in a lecture room, we're really in a container, which is the room, and that has a fixed size, obviously. And if we have air going into that room, then it just fills the entire room up. A flexible volume container would be like a balloon, where as the gas is being uh, put in, it would expand and push the boundaries of the uh, container and increasing its volume. Temperature is another property that you'll see uh, very often. It's related to some of the other properties. Uh, the unique thing about temperature is the temperature for gases is always expressed in the units of Kelvin. And you'll see why later on as we go through um, an explanation about Charles' Law, which relates temperature to volume. And lastly, we'll have uh, another um, property of gas, which is the amount of gas we have. And that's given the symbol N. And the amount is usually expressed uh, in terms of number of moles, okay, just how many gas particles we have. So here I want to point out, the before we actually get into the different gas laws, just what they are um, and, and why they're important. So one of the things that is important about the gas laws, it's called the empirical or simple gas laws a lot of times, is because these are relationships among the four properties I just mentioned, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. And they are a product of hundreds of years of uh, experimentation with gases. So people have done, you know, again, hundreds of years of, of work, of experiments with gases, and they found these relationships. The four main laws that we'll talk about are Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, Gay-Lussac's Law, and Avogadro's Law. And these all have certain... Um, description certain relationship that are important. So Boyle's law relate pressure and volume of a gas. Charles law relates volume and temperature. Gay-Lussac's relate pressure and temperature. And Avogadro's law relate volume and number of moles or amount of gas. You'll see at the end of the discussion about the simple gas laws that we can take all of these four equations together, combine them into one um, equation, which of course is what we call the ideal gas equation or the ideal gas law. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind is when we're discussing each of these laws, you see that there are always certain properties that are held constant for this relationship to be observed. So that's something you want to keep in mind. I'll mention that every time we talk about one of the laws. We're going to start here with Boyle's law. Uh, Boyle, if you remember, uh, from chapter 2 when we talked about the history of the atomic theory, he was basically what we often call the, the first uh, modern chemist because he insisted on um, 
using experimental data to back up hypotheses and theories. So he, he was kind of the first person to, to insist on this more of a scientific method type approach to um, advancing knowledge in chemistry. And his contribution in terms of the gas law is something called Boyle's law. And what he did was he performed experiments with something called a J tube, and I'll show you in a second. Actually, let me just show it right now what these things look like. This is basically a, a tube. It's called a J tube for obvious reason. It's shaped like the letter J, but it's basically open on one side. And what he did was he filled this up with mercury. Uh, and on the other side is basically some gases that have been trapped. And as you can see, if he uh, packs in more mercury, if he fills in more mercury into the J-tube, then the volume of this uh, gases is uh, less and less, right? Because now you can see it's a smaller volume compared to this one. Uh, the pressure of the gas can be determined because this is fairly sim uh, uh, you know, it's very similar to the manometer idea that we talk about in the gas pressure videos. Um, so if you want to know what exactly is the pressure, you just need to figure out what exactly is the difference between the height of the mercury on this side of the tube versus this height, this side of the tube. So he can basically record values of pressure, which is given here in this table. This is actually a data that was taken from his uh, published work. And then he can also calculate the volume of the gas that's trapped in this part of the tube by considering, you know, just the height of the, the column and then this, the diameter of the cylinder. You can use the formula for a um, volume of a cylinder in order to be able to figure out exactly what the volume of the gas is. So this was what he did. He was uh, basically trying to see, if, you know, what is the volume as a function of pressure. And what he found was interesting because here was the product of the pressure and volume values that he had. And I don't know if you can see this too clearly, but these numbers all fluctuate around 1400 or so. Okay, so they're fairly close to 1400. In other words, what these numbers, the product of these values of volume and pressure seems to be a constant, okay, a, a number that stays the same. And that's what we call Boyle's Law, okay? The product of volume and pressure of a gas yields a constant number. So in other words, mathematically, you write it as P times V equals a constant. A co the constant here is just a number, and that depends on the experimental condition. Another way to say this, of course, if, if I want to multiply two numbers and to give me a, the same number every time, right, that means that when the first number goes up, the pressure goes up, for example, then the volume has to come down in order to give me the same exact number, the same exact value of the product. So another way to say Boyle's Law is as P increases, V decreases, or vice versa. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this kind of relationship, one, one um, property goes up, the other property goes down, is what we call an inverse proportionality. In other words, they're inversely related. Okay, so as this number becomes bigger, the other number becomes smaller. So that's an inverse relationship. It's called a proportionality because there is a number, which is this constant right here, that relates P to V, okay? And we'll talk about the equation more in a couple of slides. One thing I want to keep in mind, uh, for you to keep in mind, I should say, is that the temperature in this experiment is kept relatively constant, okay? So for his, for his experiments, they're relatively constant, the temperature, but really for Boyle's Law to hold, you have to make sure that both the amount of gas that you have is the same throughout the experiment, but also that the temperature is relatively constant throughout the experiment. Okay? So another way to write Boyle's Law is, of course, the following. You can say P times V is equal to C, which is a constant. Uh, but because that means that you can change that pressure and volume, you know, in different situations, we a lot of times will indicate this as subscript. So this would be condition one, condition two, and condition three. So again, as long as P, um, you know, as long as uh, P and V um, uh, are varied, right? As they, they, their product is always equal to this constant. So you, then you can have this condition where, when at condition one pressure and volume multiplied together should be equal to pressure and volume at condition two multiplied together. 
One thing I want you to keep in mind, of course, is that in this particular, like I said earlier, the temperature and the number of moles are kept constant throughout the experiment for this equation to be true. Now, this is often called inverse proportionality, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And the reason for that is because if you take P or V and put it to the other side of the equation, then what you get is P is equal to C over V which is shown here, or you can write it as P equals C times 1 over V. And really what that means is that there's a, that's what we refer to as an inverse proportionality, because you can write it this way. P is proportional. This alpha symbol here is a proportionality, meaning that P is equal to 1 over V times a number. Okay, that number is what we usually uh, denote as a C, you know, as a constant C or K or whatever. But... Um, there is an inverse proportionality, meaning that as this number goes up, this number goes smaller, okay? So that's what inverse proportionality is. One factor is equal to one over the other factor. Um, we can see this with Boyle's law. So a couple of slides ago, remember I gave you this data, right, of Boyle's experiment. You can actually plot that data, which is shown here. This is just plotting that pressure and volume directly uh, in Excel. And what you see here is that there's this relationship that as pressure goes up, volume comes down. But it's not really clear exactly what that relationship is. But when I just plot it as pressure, and instead of volume, I change this to 1 over volume, I immediately see a straight line relationship. And the reason for that should be clear. In the equation I showed you earlier in the previous slide, and I'm showing it again right now, notice that P is equal to C times 1 over V. Okay. So if you compare this to the line equation, remember a line equation looks like this, right? Y is equal to mx plus b. So in this case, really what it is is that you, you, your p is like your y-axis because that's what you're plotting on the y-axis is pressure. Your m here is just a constant, okay? So if I move this exactly below it, notice that the m is exactly what this... Um, constant value is, whatever that value happens to be, and then your x is really just your 1 over v. So in other words, this um, data would look like a line if I were to plot it with p on one side and then the x being 1 over v on the other side. And that's exactly what we see here. We see a straight line relationship when we plot p uh, relating to 1 over v. Okay? All right. To close off this video, I want you to work on this problem. The Boyle's Law is fairly straightforward. Um, so I want you to answer this question. It's saying here that you have a balloon that's designed not to go beyond two and a half liters. If it goes beyond that, it will pop, it will burst. Um, so the question is, if you start with the balloon and it's filled with two liters of helium at sea level, uh, at one atmosphere, for example, what happens to it when it goes all the way um, to a height where the pressure is only 500 millimeters of mercury? Remember that pressure decreases as you go uh, higher and higher uh, to the at you know towards the atmosphere right above you know uh, further away from the uh, uh, surface of the Earth. So the question here is: If you go up to the level that's only 500 millimeters of mercury, will that balloon burst? Assuming temperature remains relatively constant as this. Uh, pressure changes. Okay, and you can answer that in the form that's provided next to the video.